All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 10. Again, Nehemiah, chapter 10. We've gotten through verse 31, and there are a lot of unusual names, the first 27 verses there. The Jews who have returned to Jerusalem, who have sought to reestablish the work of the priesthood, excuse me, have repaired the city uh, in its ruins, have now put themselves under a curse to either follow the laws of the Lord God or essentially be ostracized from the nation. They're getting serious about it. But, you know, religious uh, edicts never produce real spirituality in people. And nor do they bring any uh, genuine joy or sense of comfort and safety to the person that they're intended for. But we read about their decision to make these rules and put themselves under these rules, verses 29 to 31. Um, it becomes hard work to fulfill all of the requirements that they uh, initially agree to. Everybody's zealous and they're eager to do what they think is going to be easy and very uh, uh, simple to fulfill. And then they realize how difficult it is to fulfill. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ in one place pointed out the fact that when uh, a male baby was born and the eighth day following birth, the day he was to be circumcised, uh, happened to fall on the Sabbath day, then they had a dilemma. Do we circumcise him on the day that we're commanded to, which amounted, uh, amounted to at least work on the part of the priest, or do we rest on that day to fulfill the requirement of Sabbath work, rest, and thus break this law? And so once you put it all together, you realize these things aren't as easy to, uh, to keep as we thought they would be. Turn for just a minute to keep your finger here, of course. Turn to um, Ezekiel chapter 18. And go forward to Ezekiel 18. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, I won't have you turn, but Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, uh, Moses told the Israelites, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us to do exactly what we're told to do. And uh, that was the plan of salvation, uh, if you want to call it that, throughout most of the Old Testament, at least under the law. Uh, and it still existed in when the New Testament begins, in the book of Luke, chapter 1. Before John the Baptist was born uh, and before the Lord Jesus was born, we read about John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Luke 1, verse 6. It says, they were both righteous before God. And then it tells us how. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's how someone established themselves as righteous in the eyes of God by their degree of obedience to all the commandments that had been given to them to live under as Jews. But notice here in Ezekiel 18, I'll call your attention to one verse there, verse 24. <clears throat> but when the righteous, that would be someone whose righteousness has now been established, um, and everyone knows it, and everyone considers him a righteous man, because of his reputation, his uh, good deeds and actions, etc. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So that obedience had to be maintained 
through the course of your life. Run forward also to the book of Acts, chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, here in the New Testament, Acts 15, and we'll read uh, verses 8, 9, and 10. Acts 15, verses 8 through 10. Um, there were certain Jews who said uh, the Gentiles need, needed to be <clears throat> excuse me, circumcised in order to participate in the faith of Jesus Christ. And Peter stands up in this council they convene and sets the record straight. Acts 15, verses 8 through 10. He says, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, the Gentiles, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Well, what a, what a interesting blessing the Gentiles received. Their hearts were purified by faith, whereas the Jew had to try to keep his pure by strict obedience to all the laws. Verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So keeping the commandments was not an easy task, nor was it something that should be now imposed on the Gentiles who have turned to the Jew, uh, to the Jewish Messiah as well. Let's read the rest of Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 32 through 39. Also, we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God for the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, of the new moons, for the set feasts and for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. And we cast the lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God after the houses of our fathers at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law, and, quote, and to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year unto the house of, our, of the Lord, also the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks, to bring to the house of our God unto the priests that minister in the house of our God and that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees of wine and of oil unto the priests to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage and the priest the son of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God, to the chambers into the treasure house. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the, of the corn, of the new wine, and the oil unto the chambers, where are the vessels of the sanctuary, and the priests that minister, and the porters, and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of our God. This passage deals with the uh, support of the Old Testament ministry, if you want to call it that. Uh, run back for just a moment to the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 30. Exodus 30. Exodus 30, verse 13. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 giras, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. In Nehemiah's time, Nehemiah 10, verse 32, they reduced that 
annual obligation from a half shekel to a third of a shekel once a year to help support the work in the rebuild, rebuilt temple and the work of the priests, the Levites, uh, due to their extreme poverty. Uh, look back quickly, or just across the page at chapter 9 and verse 37, said, And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. So they reduced the, the uh, annual tithe from a half shekel to a third of a shekel. Now, in verse 34, they cast lots to divide the job of cutting and bringing in wood to burn on the altar. And let me have you run back again to the book of Joshua, chapter 9. Joshua, chapter 9. And uh, I won't have you turn anywhere else after this. Joshua 9. Recall in <clears throat> this chapter the story of the uh, Gibeonites. After Israel had entered into Canaan in the Promised Land, uh, the Gibeonites, you know, all the nations around heard what, God's, what God had done for the nation of Israel. The story of him dividing the Red Sea for them to cross through, the story of their conquests over other nations, uh, that reached the nations of people all around. And word of that got to these uh, uh, people of Gibeon. And uh, the Gibeonites decided to try to make a pact, and a covenant, or a, enter into a, a, an agreement or a pact with the nation of Israel. So they um, made, it look, it made it appear as though they had come from a very long distance to honor the nation whom God was now protecting. And so they put on old clothes and they brought took moldy bread with them, and, but they were only about two days away from where the land of Canaan was. So they came, and you know the, know the story, they um, persuaded the, uh, Israel to make an agreement with them. You know, they, wouldn't, they won't come in and conquer our land, and we'll recognize their God, and so on. Um, and notice here in Joshua chapter 9, Verses 19 through 21. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. So see, after Israel learns that Gibeon didn't live that far away, that they had been fooled, they had been deceived, thinking these men had come from a far distance, and they weren't, uh, they weren't far away. They were actually very close. They were a close nation that Israel would probably have to contend with one day. But Israel, uh, the representatives, they believed uh, these men's story that they had traveled a long distance uh, to come and honor uh, the nation of Israel and the nation of the Lord God. And once Israel learns that they had been deceived, but they had already made an agreement not to... Uh, not to invade, not and so forth. Verse 19, But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swear unto them. And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood, and drawers of water unto all the congregation, as the princes had promised them. Verse 27. And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day, in the place which he should choose. Once the kingdom of Judah was later uh, taken captive by Babylon, they no longer had the Gibeonites to be their servants. Now they had to go out and cut down the timber and cut down the wood to come and stoke the fire under the altar burnt offering themselves. And so here in Nehemiah 10, they're dividing these chores, these duties among themselves. It says there, 
uh, they divided them between, quote, the priests, the Levites, and the people, verse 34, and for the harvesting of their crops, there in verse 35. Every, and we'll bring this to a close a little early time, every church needs um, Mary's and Martha's, Lazarus sisters, like we read about in the Gospels. Uh, Martha was a server, a worker. Mary was a learner. And uh, everyone needs to take part in doing the mundane chores around the congregation or things that help the ministry to succeed. Uh, whether you have a small group or you have a large group or a medium-sized group, perhaps a modest-sized church as we do. But everyone should be able to find something to do and some way to support. Um, Mary was the one who wanted to sit at Jesus' feet and learn, and Martha was worried about the serving of the apostles and the tables and waiting on tables and so forth. And um, I guess we could apply it to a New Testament church. A church that has a good-sized congregation, um, it's not right that all the young mothers should be forced to stay in the nursery and not be able to hear the Bible being taught or any of the sermons. So sometimes moms have to take turns and write, make a, a schedule for themselves. Who's going to do this this week? Who's going to do it next week, etc. And uh, I think our ladies do that quite well when it comes to setting up uh, for our lunch each week. And we're blessed to have lunch here every week. But if everyone had some job to do, and there are some churches once you begin to attend, they want to assign you a job. They want to make put you to work doing something. And who knows how much of that time, is, uh, or your time is going to be taken up with that assigned job, but you're unable to hear everything that's preached or taught. Uh, likewise, you can't have people who only sit and listen and take in the lesson without doing anything to help the day-to-day -day needs get met. And so every church needs a, ideally you have a congregation of people who have a balance between that. They're willing to help, they're willing to work. I'm happy that uh, when we move tables and chairs around to set up for lunch each week, usually our young people are good at jumping in to help. Sometimes I get in there and help. Sometimes uh, we have a few, a very few that are willing to help. But it gets done. And the young ladies help to assist the older ladies setting up lunch. We have some who take turns working in the nursery when we have little ones to be looked after so that the mom and the parents can then sit in the auditorium and listen to the sermon or the Bible lesson. And everyone has some part, large or small, they can play. Whether it's picking up the trash, whether it's doing a number of any number of things, mopping the floors, uh, etc., and you get the point. So um, they divided these chores among themselves so that not one group was burdened all year long, all the time, doing just that. So they rotated and took turns in all of these works of labor.